We're going under the hood with Dr. Sunshine, where we explore topics that are relevant to STEM professionals with intersecting identities. Thank you for listening. Welcome back everyone to Under the Hood. This is episode five, where today we're gonna to talk about the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program. So we have a very special guest with us today, PhD candidate, Casey Finnerty. And once again, just to remind you all, Under the Hood is a space for aspiring current or return, retired STEM students and professionals, or your family and friends that wanna come and hear about the behind the scenes experiences, uh, about what we go through in our lives uh, as STEM professionals. And so just a little bit more about Casey. Once again, he's a doctoral candidate in the environmental engineering program at University of California, Berkeley. He earned his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from UC Berkeley in 2013. And Casey was also an NSF GRFP recipient from 2017 to 2020. His aspiration is to develop integrated technologies and approaches that create safe and sustainable access to clean drinking water. He is exploring the fields of water quality improvement, such as the removal of harmful chemical or biological contaminants. He's working on uh, water infrastructure, such as the transportation and storage of water. And he's also interested in water access, which includes tapping into new water sources through technological advancements. And so with that, welcome Casey. Happy to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I'm so excited. Um, so just a little backstory. I actually met Casey uh, during my interview for my, my current position at UC Berkeley, and he was on the student uh, hiring committee. So um, right away, I knew that uh, Casey was uh, a, a good leader in the department, and I slowly heard that he was also the GRFP whisperer. So we're happy to have him today to talk to um, rising graduate students, senior undergraduate students about how to prepare for the National Science Foundation GRFP application. Okay, so we've got, we're going to run through the gamut of the applications and best practices. So um, yeah. Let's jump right into it. Okay, so the first part of the podcast, we'll talk about general best practices for applying for this award. So let's start by talking about eligibility. So Casey, can you tell us who can actually apply for this grant in terms of citizenship status or level of education and when along the student's timeline should they ideally apply for the award? Yeah, so I, I think this is like the perfect place to start. Um, so the National Science Foundation is a government agency. And so as a result, students that are applying must either be uh, US citizens or permanent residents uh, in order to be eligible to apply. Um, additionally, students must either be enrolled in or about to enroll in a graduate program in a STEM related field. And so usually I will recommend that students try to apply twice, once as a undergraduate senior or, or even as like a working professional who's about to enroll in a graduate program. And then the second time as a graduate student. There is a uh, rule that NSF instituted a couple of years back saying that, um, that graduate students, so it, once you're enrolled in the graduate program, you're only able to apply once. And so generally um, that means either applying in your first year as a graduate student, or if, you, if it's possible uh, to apply at the beginning of uh, your second year. And does your designation as master's student or PhD matter in your first year as a grad student? It will. So yeah, there, there are definitely like all sorts of um, caveats to uh, NSF's like rules. So if you are in a kind of a, a joint master's bachelor program, uh, you can still apply in your first year in your PhD program. Um, otherwise, if you are applying, otherwise, if you like have your, um, or like in, graduate school and going through your first master's or going through to get your master's, uh, you can't have a master's um, before applying. And so you'd have to, um, in, in some cases, like a lot of graduate programs are two years. Um, and so you could apply at the beginning of your second year. Uh, Berkeley is, uh, is like one of those programs that it happens to be a one year program. And so oftentimes what uh, PhD students will do is they'll kind of push their um, 
graduation from the master's in the additional semester so that they can get kind of a year of experience under their belt, develop relationships with professors for letters of recommendation and apply um, that second year. So as you guys can see, the eligibility process can be a little bit tricky. So just keep in mind uh, whether or not you've earned a master's and um, how much time you've spent in graduate school. And so the next question I'm gonna ask is, what are the basic components of the application? Yeah, so I think like the ones that are like probably the most striking are the statements and, and, and maybe like most intimidating. Uh, so there's the uh, graduate research uh, plan statement, which, um, you know, a shorter version is the graduate, uh, the research statement. And then there's also the personal relevant background and future goals statement, which I, I usually refer to as the personal statement. And so those are uh, kind of the two written statements that um, students will need to prepare. In addition to that, there's also uh, layers of recommendation. So uh, students must submit at least three layers of recommendation, uh, somewhere between three and five uh, layers of recommendation for applying. And then some like kind of lesser known materials that are required for applying for the NS NSF are um, having a transcript. So uh, NSF has like directions on like, you know, what kind of transcript. So like an official one or if it could be printed off kind of your school's website. Um, there's also uh, a teaching and work experience relevant to your field of study. And this is kind of one of those things where it's like, as you're preparing to submit your application, you hit this section, and you're like, oh, like this is actually taking a while to like list all these different things. And so uh, I do recommend like knowing ahead of time that that's like a part of the, the application process. And then the final section is the honors, fellowship, scholarship, publications, and presentations. And this is kind of like an open-ended box that you can format how, how you need to, uh, but it's also kind of one of those application components that takes a while. And if you're, you know, close to the, the midnight deadline or something like that, uh, can really add a lot of stress. So I do recommend like working and thinking through those uh, way ahead of time uh, before you uh, end up submitting. Great, thank you. Then our next question here is uh, about the timeline for how much time the applicant should be spending putting their applications together. I think this is critical. Um, you've actually devised a wonderful timeline for your internal uh, guidance document for our department. And so can you tell our listeners um, a little bit about the optimal timeline for putting together a competitive application for the GRFP program? The GRFP. Yes, yeah. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to a friend of mine, Emily Cook, who's uh, another PhD student at UC Berkeley, and uh, we work together on preparing the, this timeline and the guides. Um, so yeah, definitely a team effort to put this together. Uh, but basically, the NSF GRFP is typically due mid-October, uh, kind of plus or minus a week or so. And uh, to give yourself enough time to prepare, we usually recommend uh, six to eight weeks um, at least. And so that, that roughly translates into about two months, which um, uh, would put you kind of mid-August as like kind of your, your starting, you know, when you want to kick things off. The main reason we recommend starting this early is basically to accommodate letter of recommendation writers. Uh, a lot of times these are professors, working professionals, um, people who have a lot on their plate. And so uh, they, they kind of need that heads up uh, as they, uh, that you want a letter of recommendation uh, from them. And so, and they'll need kind of like constant reminders throughout those two months, uh, just to make sure that, you know, checking in on the progress of the letter, uh, making sure that they, like received the link uh, from NSF to submit the letter and then that they actually submitted it. So uh, that's kind of one of the, one of the main things um, for starting mid-August, about two months before the application is due. The other thing is that um, preparing the statements, uh, it, it's like a much larger process than just, you know, writing a draft and it being ready to go. I think um, preparing a research statement requires reading lots of uh, publications and scientific papers. Um, I also recommend reading through uh, other people's uh, statements and getting an idea of like different elements that you really like that they did in their applications and incorporating that style and um, those unique aspects into your own uh, application package. Um, and then uh, writing the statements, you know, it, it's a, it, takes, it takes a lot of time. And then once you have a draft that you're happy with, then it's like time to get revisions on it. And so asking friends, colleagues, mentors uh, to revise it and um, 
give you feedback and then like kind of iterating through those drafts is like super important. And I think that like iteration process takes at least a month um, just because uh, the timing of this also happens to be kind of like at the beginning of the school year. And so you'll be starting up classes. It's due right around midterm time. And so uh, you'll have a lot of things going on. So the more you work ahead of time, the happier you'll be for sure. That's great advice, especially uh, around this time of the year. It's time mm -hmm. to get started with your application. <laughs> So the, the next question I'm going to ask to round out this topic about best practices. So I'd like to talk to the students that um, may be on the fence about whether or not they should apply for the GRP. So what are some important self-reflections for an applicant that may be on the fence? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's so important to kind of think through like what the, the longer term implications of applying to the NSF GRP might be. And so generally, the NSF is used to uh, support PhD students in their research. Um, it can be used uh, if you're just interested in your master's uh, to support that. Uh, but a large majority of the people who apply for the NSF end up using it for uh, funding kind of their cost of living and their research uh, expenses. And so uh, the PhD process, uh, so NSF will provide you with uh, funding for three years, but the PhD process is actually much larger than that usually four plus years. Um, and so if you're kind of going down that track, it's definitely worth like at the beginning to think like, is that what I wanna do? And what do I wanna do in life? And do I need a PG to necessarily get there? And sometimes the answer is no, and that's totally fine. And if the answer happens to be no, I think that like it's, it's worth kind of making that decision to not apply for the NSF, uh, just because that'll give you more time to like, pursue activities that will help you kind of pursue those, those other goals. But if the answer is yes, then it's good to kind of come to that decision early because you want to like be certain and like be able to like write your statements with conviction. And if you're not, you, if you don't have to convince yourself, it's much easier to convince other people who will be evaluating your application. So uh, yeah, just like thinking kind of in early August or mid August about like, is this a direction that you want to go down? And if it is, um, just like really fully committing to like working on the statements, applying to graduate school, if that's also something you're gonna be doing. Um, and then like going down that route. And what's also nice too is like, it's, you can always, you, you have until like mid, or like you'll find out about the NSF like around mid April. And so if something dramatic changes or you, you find that a different career path is better for you, uh, you can always reject the NSF uh, GRP. That's totally fine. Um, and if you reject it before the deadline, you can reapply if you like, end up going back uh, to uh, applying for graduate school. And so uh, I believe that um, as long as you reject it like within the deadline and that doesn't expire, and then um, you're about to like enroll in a program, you can reapply um, for the NSF GRP. That's good to know. Okay. <laughs> lots, of, lots of opportunities to like jump back and forth, which uh, I think we can all relate to. Absolutely. Life is a highway. Mm -hmm. So the, thank you for that. Those are some good best practices. And so now we're going to jump into some specifics about the application, particularly mm -hmm. review criteria. So by review criteria, I mean metrics upon which the reviewers are looking to evaluate whether the application is strong or not. And so for those of you that may not know, there are two important review criteria for NSF proposals, including the GRFP. And that and those are intellectual merit and broader impacts. You may hear us say IM and BI, so intellectual merit and broader impacts. So let's introduce our listeners or uh, reintroduce our listeners to these two review criteria. And can you tell us about that, Casey? Sure, yeah. I think um, this is a, a general, good practice uh, just to see how you're being evaluated. And I think like that's something I definitely overlooked when I was applying uh, the first time to the NSF. Um, the, ideally, the, they're telling you exactly what they're like specifically looking for and how they kind of define these two terms, uh, intellectual merit and broader impacts are like, they're looking at those things. And so when you receive your feedback, they're gonna provide you feedback on like the intellectual merit and the broader impacts of uh, your application package. Um, so yeah, it's a very central thing. Uh, 
in, for the NSFDRFP. Uh, there are definitions online, uh, but they're kind of like hard to sift through. And so like for intellectual merit, for example, it says uh, potential for the proposed activity to advance knowledge and understanding within its own field and across different fields, which I don't exactly know what that means. And so my, I, how I kind of like redefined this or how uh, Emily and I worked on redefining this was that uh, this intellectual merit evaluates if you are ready to conduct research uh, from a technical standpoint. And so it's like, do you have the experience, skills, and knowledge that you would need to succeed in lab? Similarly, broader impacts, uh, formal definition, potential for the proposed activity to benefit society or advance desired societal outcomes. We think that broader impacts evaluates that if you're ready to conduct research from a moral standpoint, do you genuinely care about society at large and the individuals within that society and how your research would uh, affect them? That's great. So that's a great introduction to those two re review criteria. And so I'd like to get into the specifics. Um, and so can you explain to the listeners, what are some examples of specific elements of an application that reflect a high level of intellectual merit? Definitely. Yeah. So um, intellectual merit, it's kind of one of those things, or like, so for both of them, they're going to like have to permeate every kind of, every material you submit for your application. So uh, that'll be your, both your statements. That, that's kind of what you have the most control over. So both of the statements for sure. And I'll get into uh, greater detail about that. Letters of recommendation as well. Um, I think highlighting specific things that can be related to intellectual merit. And especially if you have a letter of recommendation writer who is outside of um, kind of the more academic circles, it's worth to highlight that like, these are the things that they're evaluating us on. And so I would like it you know, even if you have a different phrase for it to like phrase it as intellectual merit or something like that. And then um, I think the, for intellectual merit in particular, uh, it's very much uh, those kind of that one section where it talks about like awards and like um, presentations and certain things like that. Uh, they're looking for kind of very specific like research indicators uh, for success. And so uh, listing kind of like all the presentations that you've done, um, you know, all the uh, research contributions that you've made um, in that section, I think is uh, a, a, like one thing that like the NSF evaluators will like cling on to be like, okay, like this person has, has some experience and like kind of knows um, what they're doing if they were to kind of get this grant and be uh, responsible for conducting research. In the statements itself, um, I think it's like worth kind of identifying like how intellectual merit is defined like in the personal statement versus like the research statement, um, just to, to avoid redundancy, you don't have you have uh, three pages for your uh, personal statement and then two for your uh, research statement, and so you, that sounds like a lot before you start writing. But once you get into it, it's like oh, I wish I had, I had more pages. So uh, to avoid redundancy, you definitely want to like kind of strike a balance of like how you're portraying intellectual merit in your personal versus your research statement. In the personal statement. Um, we recommend kind of like looking at like, what are the qualities, uh, like what qualities are you highlighting? So uh, common ones are curiosity, motivation, uh, persistence, analytical thinking and creativity. Um, other attributes that kind of indicate uh, your intellectual merit uh, are like kind of experiences in the lab. So like what projects have you worked on? Uh, what presentations have you contributed to or publications you have contributed to outside of the lab? Um, this could be like course projects. So like, were you working on a, like a design project or something like that? And what role did you play? And that really kind of highlights analytical thinking. And then um, I think teamwork and leadership is, a, is another sign of uh, intellectual merit that they look onto. So any leadership or teamwork opportunities uh, that you can highlight. I think that leadership is probably like emphasized more, but being a team player and being able to work with the team is so important just in like once you're in, <laughs> in the lab, uh, you, you'll realize that like, you know, this person like can help you with this technique and that person can help you with this. And it's, it's definitely a give and take in research. So I uh, don't discount uh, your teamwork experiences. And uh, I think the last thing, and this is um, something I'll, I'll probably end up saying a lot today is like the organization of your statements uh, is so important. It's just, uh, you have these um, evaluators who are probably reading, you know, multiple applications every day. And basically they're gonna spend, you know, a, a set amount of time on your application. You basically wanna convey as much information as you can as possible. 
And that really comes through the organization. And so uh, if you have like headings and subheadings, and so like something that, like if you can make it as skimmable as possible, that's really gonna help them out. And uh, in turn, they'll like get a better sense of who you are as an applicant. And so the organization I think is like, I link it with intellectual merit because it kind of shows this maturity in like your thought process and like thinking about like who the evaluator is. And so uh, I think that that's a, a key point. On the research statement side, I think uh, intellectual merit really comes through like how rigorous the, the proposal is. Um, have you identified an interesting topic? Uh, do you know the methods and methodology that um, would be required to evaluate uh, that topic as well as like how you evaluate the results? and then uh, setting realistic uh, research goals. And this can be very hard for uh, you, even like, you know, uh, older PhDs, <laughs> it's like to set like realistic research goals for yourself um, in like a three to five year kind of range. Um, and that, I think that's where like those revisions are helpful, getting uh, input from, from professors, from graduate students to be like, okay, like you're, this is a fascinating work, but you're proposing like 10 years of work. <laughs> and so uh, just like being able to scope it appropriately, I think is, uh, another part of uh, intellectual merit when it comes to the research statement. That's great. And we'll segue directly into the, the analog, which is what are specific examples of an application that reflects a high potential for broader impacts? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So similarly, uh, should permeate kind of all the application materials with regards to the statements, which um, you have a kind of more control, like we were saying, uh, over. Uh, so for the personal statement, you really want to highlight kind of what are your like underlying motivations for engaging in this work and uh, what kind of experiences have kind of informed your decision. And um, I think like one thing to know is like those experiences don't have to be like rosy. They can like, you know, they can be messy. It can be, you know, start out with like a mistake you realize you had made that like you didn't realize at the time. It really wants to show that you've kind of like developed and grown into kind of having this, this these broader impacts in mind. And um, yeah, and just like how that's really kind of solidified your decision to kind of move forward. And that's where uh, that like deciding whether to apply for the NSFDRFP at the beginning is really helpful. Is like, you know, this is what you wanna do and you're gonna just go for it full force. Um, I think the last thing with kind of like the personal statement is um, you like, I think the really good statements, they, they speak to one another. And so your uh, research statement and your personal statement, they like kind of echo one another. And it's really convincing the evaluator that you and only you are the one to do this research. Like, because you have the experiences that you have, the, the growth and lessons that you've, you've undertaken, that you are ready and motivated and want to do this research and you are able to do it to an extent that no one else would be able to. And so, um, Getting that alignment, I think, is uh, when it's it's challenging. But if you can, like that, really sets your statement, uh, your statements above and beyond um, everyone else's. And so, uh, so why you specifically uh, should be doing that research on the research statement side? Um, I think it's being able to relate the work to how it would impact the broader society and kind of like what the outcomes would be down the line. Um, I think other aspects of it too include communication. So. Uh, how are you going to disseminate the results? Are you going to go to conferences? Are you going to, I think find there, there's a lot of uh, value in like novelty. And so are you going to find like creative ways, uh, kind of like this podcast, like creative ways of getting information out there um, as well as outreach. And so being able to kind of incorporate uh, what you're doing in the lab and like exciting, you know, the next generation to engage in, um, you know, really cool STEM related uh, fields, I think is, another aspect of like how broader impacts uh, fits into the research statement. Thanks, Casey. I think that was really helpful. And I think this is a perfect segue to speak more specifically about the statements. Mm -hmm. And so just to keep the readers on, the listeners on track, we talked about the review criteria, the things that they're looking for in the statements. Now we're gonna talk specifically about the components of the statement and how you should go about organizing your time and developing these statements. So the first thing I'm gonna ask, so in terms of the research statement, what is the purpose of the document 
and what makes a research statement strong? Yeah, I, so the research statement is um, essentially kind of like, can you prepare a well-written and interesting research proposal? Um, it, it's worth noting that you are not obligated to uh, conduct the research that you do propose in your actual um, graduate program. Uh, as, as you all will learn, you know, there are so many external factors that affect what research you end up working on. And so NSF understands that reality. And so uh, I think that, uh, yeah, just like being able to form kind of a well-formulated research proposal is like one step to it. Um, I think the other side of that is like being more daring with that research proposal. Cause you know, there are a lot of, um, a lot of funding agencies out there that are funding research through different avenues. And so NSF is really wanting to like invest in that like big jump. And so I, I always encourage students to get creative uh, with whatever research statement they're, they're putting together and really like uh, kind of shooting high for um, what they're doing within kind of within reason. Um, you have to have kind of the, the um, background uh, research and uh, like the reading the literature just to make sure that like it makes physical sense, but yeah, definitely um, want to uh, emphasize originality and like uh, going big for that research statement. Uh, I think the other side of this is the, just kind of sounding like you know what you're, you're doing. Um, I know there are many times where I feel that I like, like don't know what I'm doing and, and you kind of figure it out as you go. But uh, yeah, I think in the research statement, it's really important to kind of like convey a certain amount of certainty and, and confidence. Um, and so uh, that, I think that comes with, with the revisions is a big part of it. And as well as like doing a lot of background reading on it. And then uh, I mentioned this before, but the organization I think is, is so important for, for both the personal and the research statement. And so just making sure that you are making effective use of uh, headers and um, italics and underline. Uh, that's one thing is I, I thought was silly. At first was like, if you have like a really big thing, like a really, like say you contributed or a co-author on a, a paper and you wanna make sure that they see that, like underline it. And like, it, it seems ridiculous, but it's just like the reviewer is gonna look through it and they're like, oh, there's only like two things underlined on here. I'm gonna read those for sure. And so like, that's um, part of what I mean with organization is like really like helping the, the reviewer uh, hone in on the specific things that you want them to. Okay, that, that's great, that's great. And so we're gonna jump right over to talking about the personal statement. And so I'm gonna ask, what are the key components of the personal statement? And how is the personal statement different from the research statement? Yes, yeah, so the um, personal statement is basically the story of you and how you decided to pursue kind of this career in research. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, I recommend generally starting on the research statement because uh, like I, I think like that one's hard enough to prepare and so you don't want to kind of like put bounds on it. Um, whereas like your, your own experiences, you know, it's like they like hold this kind of complicated space within you and like you can kind of like orient them in, in different ways. And so your personal statement, you can kind of like weave into this story that speaks with your research statement. And so I think if you're really genuine about like approaching the research statement and pursuing something that you're really excited about, that alignment is actually um, easier to do. And so I think um, just kind of thinking about how your personal statement will speak with your uh, research statement is one side of it. Uh, the other key components I think is a hook. So um, I, I'm sure uh, it, this happens in research papers a lot where if you're in a certain field and you, you read the introduction and like, it's like the same paragraph over and over again. It's like, this is gonna like, like this is a great problem and a huge challenge and like, it, it, it kind of like you, as a reader, you kind of like turn off and you're like, are gonna skim until like you see something new again. And so I think the same thing happens with these NSF uh, applications is that it, it's easy to kind of like fall into more generic, uh, almost cliche sounding introductions, make it unique, make it something that like grabs the reader's attention and like, cause that's like precious time and like, and so yeah, have some kind of hook that really draws the reader in and then, um, and then like, yeah, take it from there. The other thing, NSF really focuses on uh, what they call outcomes. That's kind of like a nebulous term for like, what are the, the tangible real world uh, results resulting from a certain activity? And so did kind of this work result in a presentation somewhere or did you build something or 
uh, is there like an observable measurable difference between like before and after a certain activity? And so um, relating things or like talking about things, not only in terms of personal growth, but in terms of like real world outcomes, I think is uh, another important aspect of the personal statement. And lastly, uh, it's gonna sound like a broken record, the organization. <laughs> so just having those, those headings and like really uh, guiding the, the reader through your statement uh, with like a nice good structure using justified um, alignment. That, that sounds silly, but like uh, it, makes it, sound, it makes it look a lot cleaner. And so um, yeah, definitely uh, the organization, just like making it look clean. It's like, it, it's silly how much that affects the reader's opinion of like the statements. And so uh, just like, I'm gonna hammer it down again and again, the organization is so important for these statements. Thank you, I actually agree. I'm gonna echo the justified alignment. That means it's straight on both sides. To be honest, I can't read a document. I can't review and edit a document sometimes if it's left, left justified. So I will go through and justify everything. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Lastly, to round out the discussion about personal statements and the research statement, let's talk about the revision process again. So let's really hone in on what is important about the revision process and who the students should be getting to review their essays. Can you talk about that? Yes, of course. I'm really glad you asked this because revisions are so important um, for the, the whole preparation of the statements. And I can't stress that enough. Um, so the reason we recommend having your first drafts done kind of by mid-September earlier if you can, uh, is so that you have this space and time to make these revisions. And so at the beginning, you know, it's it's more just important putting pen to paper, or, you know, starting to type out uh, the statements. And the first draft is going to be rough. Even if you if you spend a week on it, if you spend a month on it, it's going to be rough no matter what. And so um, I recommend kind of at that early stage asking kind of a close friend or colleague to give you feedback on the statement. Uh, and that's to kind of pick up those small things that you overlook. You, you'll be staring at, at your statement for so many hours <laughs> that you'll begin to uh, kind of just skip over things. There, there'll be like certain connections that you make in your own mind that don't translate when someone else is reading it. And so that's kind of what that, that first round of re revisions for is just making sure it makes sense to someone that's not you. Next, uh, as it starts to get more polished, I recommend trying to find uh, graduate students. And so uh, if you've talked to a graduate student STEM related field, they've worked on their own application. They've worked on um, application or like proposals for, for grants. And you, there's a lot of writing involved in, um, in graduate school. And so they'll have kind of a sense of like, kind of helping you like scope your research statement, uh, certain things that evaluators are looking for. They'll just kind of have a little bit more insight into um, like certain aspects of your research statement to help it along. And so if you're uh, working in a lab, talking to the graduate students in that lab, if you have a TA you're close with, that's also a really good resource. Um, basically anyone who has like some experience with scientific writing uh, that you can find, um, seeing if they're willing to read your statement. As your statement kind of is like building kind of this momentum, I think at this point it's worth um, approaching a professor to review your statement. So this could be your potential PI, it could be um, one of your letter of recommendation writers, it could be a teacher um, or an instructor that you have. And the reason that this step is key is that the NSF GRFP evaluators are actually generally professors. And so they, there's a certain language that they speak back and forth to one another. They like know what each other wants and likes. And so uh, when they're writing their, um, their, like, their letter of recommendation, like, it's like exactly oriented to like what you know, the, the evaluator's looking for. And so, um, and similarly with the statements, they'll, they'll be able to kind of like give you this like insight that is like really hard to know as a, as a senior undergraduate student or as a, as even as a graduate student. And so, um, yeah, having a professor look at that kind of like later stage statement uh, is really important. And then finally, uh, the final draft is like, find, you know, that friend who's really good at grammar <laughs> and writing and uh, have them kind of polish, you know, like make sure you're, you know, you're using semicolons correctly and stuff like that. And so um, having them kind of do that final run through just to make sure everything's grammatically correct um, before your statement is kind of finalized. Thanks, Casey. I'm gonna follow up. Did you ever use the University Writing Center for this process? You know, I didn't, but that is a great resource. Uh, universities have 
writing support. And uh, definitely, yeah, it, they do, uh, especially I think some will even have some like specifically for like NSF because um, that's just something that everyone applies for. And so uh, they will have not only like kind of like people that can read your statement, but they also have like their own, you know, like list of advice and, and things uh, to help counsel you as you're applying. So definitely seek out what resources exist at, at your universities and the writing centers are like, I think an underutilized resource and um, something that uh, I think like our, the guide that we put together like doesn't point to enough, um, but yeah, is, is huge. So uh, I, I wanna thank you for calling that out. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about in terms of the GRFP application are letters of recommendation. So Casey alluded to this earlier. And the first question I'm gonna ask is, who should the students ask to write their letters? And when and how should they ask for the letters? Yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of what we were talking about before, I do recommend trying to find professors as, um, you know, at least one or two of those letter recommendation writers. Um, it's, yeah, all three, uh, that's also okay. Um, and so you're trying to, the reason for that, and I'll just repeat this, is that the evaluators and the professors are kind of like able to communicate very well to one another. And so if you want them to highlight certain things, like they'll know how to do that in a way that like the NSF evaluator will um, kind of value. So like certain indicators, they'll be like, oh, this helped with this project, which, you know, they have kind of that like that broader scope of like what is gonna happen with research projects down the line and they can like relay that back. Um, and so I, that's why I do recommend finding professors, but you don't have to, especially as an undergraduate, it's um, kind of hard to have like a, a large list of, of professors that you want to approach. So this, you could also approach um, like your boss at work, uh, if you did an internship, um, and also your instructors, uh, I think is another good one. And that kind of links with the, the next point I want to make is that you want uh, professors to highlight different aspects of you. And so kind of all these application materials are intended to kind of give your evaluator this, this full picture as, or as full of a picture as they can of you as a, uh, as a researcher. And so um, having, say you're uh, working, you had an internship where you're doing research, having that person um, write your letter of recommendation to like highlight your research capabilities and then having say a teacher of yours, um, a professor that uh, taught a class that you maybe um, struggled with at the beginning but went to office hours and like really developed a close relationship and like have this kind of academic success story um with uh to like have them highlight that and like focus on that journey and so that way the evaluators just kind of can see like different sides of you you as a as a student you as a researcher you as a worker um you as a uh competition team participant uh you know it's uh they want to highlight kind of different aspects of you. If they get three letters, they're all saying kind of like the same thing. So like, say you have a professor and a graduate student all in the same lab, like talking about the same things, like you are missing an opportunity to kind of show them more is, is what I'll say on that. With regards to when and how, um, early earlier heads up is always better. So uh, I would say, you know, sometime between uh, mid-August and September, like starting to, uh, send that those emails out. Um, those emails can definitely be daunting. And so our guide has like sample emails that you can use. Uh, it's always good to remind the professors who you are, um, especially if you are like a student in a large class. Um, it, it like, it, it's easy to kind of get lost in that. Or if it was like a couple semesters ago, like reminding them like, oh, I took your class back at this time. We, I like, I remember like these things and, um, and so like, it, just to like kind of like trigger their memory so that they, they remember who you are. And um, I think, uh, yeah. So like, I think that that's like really important is like uh, contacting them over email and then like early and frequently. <laughs> and so uh, sometimes those uh, emails will get lost in their inbox. And so just bumping out to the top of the inbox, thinking about like when they might be checking their email or even like if you know, like a graduate student in their lab, sometimes they have good insights on like when the best time to reach out to that professor is. So. Uh, that could be, you know, Monday morning, or maybe it's like Monday at lunch after they've gotten through the initial list, and then it's like, oh, this is back on top. And so uh, there's a lot of like kind of social engineering involved with uh, trying to get corral your your letter of recommendation writers to like uh, one it, 
acknowledge that uh, they would want to write a letter of recommendation and then making sure that they get it in by the deadline. Absolutely. Um, and we'll talk about how to get an affirmative confirmation on that in just a second. So this next question I wanna ask is regarding the content of the letter, should students you know, take the initiative to tell the letter writer or make suggestions about what they want to go into their letter? Yes, 100%. Um, if you make their lives as easy as possible, that, um, you know, it, it's like those small things. It affects their mood and they're like, oh, like this will be easier. And therefore I'm gonna put more into it. And so, yeah, if you can guide them to specific experiences that you want them to highlight, uh, more information, the better. You can even like write like full paragraphs and like, oh, like this is from my recollection. This is what I remember happening uh, here. And like that will help them tremendously. And because they're, you know, spending less, you know, mental energy trying to remember like certain things, they will be able to talk about those things more specifically and in greater detail. And so it just really creates a richer layer of recommendation um, on their end. And so, yeah, give them as much information as you can um, is what I recommend. Wonderful, I concur. Um, usually I can write a good letter when I have some bullet points to work off of. And so the last question about letters of recommendation I wanna ask are, or is, what if the applicant, what if the student doesn't receive confirmation that the professor, instructor, or mentor is going to write the letter? What if they don't hear back? Yeah, it, it, it is tricky. I think, um, because professors work at their, their their own speed a lot of times. And so uh, sometimes, you know, you won't hear that from them the entire time. And uh, you'll have listed them on NSF and then like, you know, come mid-October, like, oh, I submitted it. It's like, oh, like all this stress I've been feeling for the last two months, like was that, you know, would have been saved if you just like told me that, you know, a while ago. Um, I think that sometimes if they don't get back to you, that may be like not a great indicator that they'll write a strong layer of recommendation. And so, um, and so like, I think it's like worth looking elsewhere uh, if you're like not getting that confirmation back. That doesn't mean you have to scrap them entirely. You could, you basically get to choose the order of your layer of recommendations. And so uh, you could submit up to five and the first three are the ones that'll get, that get written. And so it's good to have kind of some backups in mind. And so you can, if that one um, person it's not getting back to you. You can move them to four, move them to five, and um, kind of look for someone else to to fill that in. And then, uh, if they do end up submitting before the deadline, you could like swap it around. Um, but that way, you like will at least meet the minimum required layers of recommendation, and so your application will still be um, eligible for review. And so, just making sure that you kind of get those three, uh, I think, gives you peace of mind. And then, for that one person who's kind of maybe poor at communicating back or like not getting back to you at all, then they're just kind of a backup as opposed to like something you're really relying on. That's perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Okay, and so we talked about best practices, broader impacts, intellectual merit and the letters and the essays. I wanna get a little, go a little bit under the hood and talk about some of the barriers for students that they may face when they're trying to submit these applications. And so this first one has to deal with an announcement that was made in 2020 by the National Science Foundation that they will be prioritizing applications related to artificial intelligence, quantum information science, and computationally intensive research. Should this be a deterrent for applicants? And what can we say about the traditionally funded areas uh, of NSF? Are they still competitive areas to submit about? Yeah, I, this is this is really big. I think a, a, there's a lot of backlash uh, online about this. Um, I would say that like, do not let this discourage you from applying. Like, if you are working on a more kind of traditional field using more traditional methods, that's totally fine and valid. And I think that like, um, if you know like that's the way to do things, like, don't change that. Like, I think like like keep going forward on that. Um, it does kind of give you some insight into like what NSF's kind of priorities are and like how they're kind of um, shifting a little bit. And so uh, I would say like, if there are ways of like incorporating things like artificial intelligence, um, what was it, quantum information sciences and computationally intensive research, 
if you can incorporate those things into your research, uh, I, I would encourage you to do so, but um, don't try and force it, I would say. If it doesn't make sense or, um, yeah, if it doesn't make sense, then like, I think that like ends up kind of sticking out and it's like, oh, like this, this doesn't match here. And like, it just like kind of, you'll get dinged on kind of the intellectual merit side of things. And so, um, but I think like in, in like research, like these are like, it is a really reality that like these computational methods are becoming more and more prevalent. And so uh, it might be worth talking with a um, graduate student or a professor about like, you know, are these methods being used in this field in a way that makes sense? And is there a way to like sensibly incorporate that into, into the research that I'm doing? And so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's worth trying, but like, don't don't let it discourage you from applying, and um, don't try and force it if it's if it doesn't it's, if it's not like an appropriate match. Excellent advice. Yep, there are many ways that traditional fields are branching into computational computationally intensive methods, and it is worth it to consult someone about this if you want to go that way. Okay, and so my next question about application barriers is. So can you talk about, in your experience, what are some of the common reasons that students decide, hey, I just can't do it this year, and then they don't complete their application? Yeah, I think um, there, there are a lot of factors. I think um, what we talked about at the beginning, so we call this waffling. And so um, if you're not like 100% certain that you want to pursue a PhD and like you don't like, up, like address that question up front, um, then I think like there's this like kind of like this voice in the back of your head every time like you're working on your statements being like oh like this is hard like you know wouldn't you rather like work on this like three other problem sets that you need to do for homework and so it's like I think that like if you decide and commit early like that helps so much and so I uh, kind of like addressing that question like at the beginning I think is one thing the other um I think like important aspect is uh that like just like realizing that you're not going to be applying to NSF in a vacuum, like August is like when classes start back up for, for a lot of universities. And so first week of classes is gonna be hectic. Um, and then, you know, as it continues into mid term season, it's gonna even be more chaotic. And so I think, um, yeah, just like the time management and like trying to work up front uh, is really helpful. And, um, and so like, I think that that time management is like a really important aspect is like realizing that you're gonna have to be working on these statements while juggling a lot of other things. And it's gonna be like a really uh, kind of intense semester until mid-October. Um, but I, I do like, I think that it's so important, especially if you're an undergraduate senior, like it's worth applying because um, I think the best experience you can, or like kind of the best way to prepare yourself to apply for the NSF is to have done it at least once. And so uh, if you don't get it as an undergraduate senior, like you get another chance as a graduate student and you have your feedback to work off of. And so, you know, Kind of the ways that like you can like they're telling you exactly how to like improve your statement and um and you can like incorporate that in i think the last thing is that the application and this kind of ties in with the other two things the application itself is really daunting um you know getting asked to like find three layers of recommendation i remember as an undergrad looking at that and being like i'm not close with like any of my professors like and so uh, and so that, i think that that's a big barrier where it's just like realizing that like oh I should have been kind of fostering this uh these relationships and then like maybe like thinking back and like you know what I actually like did have a closer relationship with this one professor and like maybe it's worth worth asking them um and and then like I think the research statement too a lot of times this is the first time that many students will be preparing a research proposal and so uh that too is like just not knowing where to start can be really daunting and so um our, our guide provides a lot of guidance on like okay like this is you know step one step two, step three, this is how to structure the statement. And so like, I think trying to um, uh, just like demystify that process as much as you can uh, is important. And so reading other proposals, talking to people um, about like kind of the mechanics of it, that way it's not this like big dark cloud that's this research statement. It's, it's something that is like, okay, like there are certain parts of it that like I can do. And then there's certain parts I need to work on. Absolutely, that's a great segue into uh, the next and last question about barriers. And that is for students that may not have had the early exposure, they may not know other people who are current fellows or past fellows. 
what can they do now in mid-August if they're, they want to all of a sudden apply to, uh, to the application or apply for the fellowship? What can they do now to increase their chances of submitting a successful application? Yeah, I think um, one thing that like, uh, like can always be done more is like reading through like the applications of like successful students. And so there are a lot of resources online, uh, especially if you can find statements that are like relevant to, to your field. Um, I think that that is really helpful because then you can kind of see like, okay, like this is, you, you at least have like a, a like an image of your mind of like, okay, like this person did X, Y, and Z and that, that's how they got there. I haven't done X, Y, and Z, but I've done like A, B, C. And so maybe like those uh, will like kind of fill in this gap and, and uh, that'll fill this other gap. And then you'll also kind of realize that there are still gaps, um, which is totally fine. I think that um, that's a huge benefit for people applying in their undergrad is that they've identified those gaps like a year ahead of when they may be applying again. And so, um, and so like you have that year to kind of fill in those gaps. And so like next year, it's not like you're coming to it for the first time and being like realizing that those gaps are there because everyone has their gaps. And so um, I think that's like one thing to, to just like not let it discourage you is that like Noah's application is perfect. Um, reading through other people's statements, like I, I think you, you see all the, the good things but that's what they're highlighting. And so um, just be aware that like there are people with their insecurities and their own weaknesses um, you know, that's everyone. And, uh, you know, it, don't let that discourage you. Um, and so, yeah, reading through those applications uh, and identifying kind of like this, this, this certain spots that you want to kind of make progress in, in like in the coming months um, is, is one aspect uh, that I recommend. Um, I think two is like starting to develop those relationships with professors. And so um, either kind of like catching back up with like a, an old professor that you had or um, say you have a, a new professor, uh, like going to their office hours um, and then just kind of like finding mentors uh, that like have experience with the NSF. Um, that could be graduate students, that could be professors. Um, and like just talking with them about like, you know, this is where I'm at, this is where I'm thinking I wanna go. And like, just like kind of like talking that out and then like getting their input on it and like uh, what they would recommend doing. And so. I think talking to people and uh, yeah, just like that self-reflection that comes from reading other applications are like two really good things and productive things that students could do. Wonderful. And I'll have some links in the description box for the online examples of winning proposals. Thanks, Casey. Yeah. And so we're getting toward the end of the podcast. And I just want to ask a couple questions about uh, what students can expect once they've submitted and maybe even been awarded the fellowship. So uh, what are your recommendations and um, for the perspectives and actions that a student should take once they've successfully submitted their application in mid-October? Mm -hmm. I think the, the number one thing is uh, print out your materials. <laughs> like uh, I, I'm still, I still can't find my first application. It would have been so helpful to like have reference later. Um, I think I just like saved it in some file path. I like can't find it. So like download those materials and keep them somewhere safe um, for, for referencing later. Um, I think also keeping your letter of recommendation writers in the loop, just like, just like, I wanna thank you for writing me a letter of rec recommendation. It seems like all the materials are in. Uh, I will keep you posted on when I hear back. And then I think the last thing is just like patting yourself on the back. I mean, it's not an easy feat to, uh, prepare this this whole application package three layers of recommendation two two full statements like that's that's harder than like a lot of graduate applications and if you are applying for graduate school it's like great like it's a great foundation for preparing those graduate applications so uh, definitely keep those statements uh, in mind they're, they're going to keep coming back and so um, yeah just like take a moment to like you know just be like yeah I did this and it's it's not easy and uh, taking that first step I think is like the hardest part and if you you just took that first step so be proud of yourself that's right very good be proud of yourself and in the case that someone is selected to, as a winner do the fellows have to attend the institution that they indicated that they'd attend in their application do they actually have to go to that institution you do not yeah you don't have to attend the institution and uh, you don't have to do the research that you proposed um, and so, yeah, like uh, you don't, 
I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I'm missing. But yeah, a lot of times undergraduate seniors apply to the NSF and they apply to graduate schools. And so they actually don't know if they're like even accepted to that institution. So, um, uh, you know, but like, so like NSF knows that like, there's kind of like this big question mark when it comes to like what direction these students are going. So they, um, they like don't hold you to that. So I wouldn't worry about like identifying certain institutions or certain professors that you wanna work with. Um, like definitely like do that because it shows you've done your, your homework when it comes to applying, uh, but you're not tied to doing any of that. Wonderful. And lastly, is there any advice that you'd like to give to applicants or is there anything I didn't touch on so far? I, I think this, this covered a lot of it. Um, like the two main things I do want to emphasize um, are like revisions are so important. I think that's like a, like a hidden, hidden like task within preparing those statements. And so like really emphasizing those, uh, that iteration through revisions the organization of your statements, making it as skimmable and easily digestible for your evaluators. And then I think the last thing is that like the NSF is like not the end all be all. Um, like we use this metaphor in our guide that uh, basically it's uh, once you submit it, it's kind of like pulling names out of a hat, but like you have to do so much right in order to get your name into that hat. And so once you do that and like get it in there, like if you're not selected, it's it's not the end of the world. It shouldn't be a reflection on, on you um, as a researcher, as an individual, because it's just, there's so many people applying and it just, you know, you could have one evaluator who's like in a bad mood and like, he's like, you know, just being like very critical of like every application they're reading. If you happen to get that, that professor, like that's not your fault. You couldn't control that. And so, um, yeah, it, it's, it's just, it's one, like one evaluation and it's, you know, it's not perfect. Like no application process is. Um, and so like, I wouldn't, don't take it too personally. I got rejected twice before getting NSF. So um, yeah, definitely familiar with, with getting that rejection letter. So it's, uh, yeah, don't, don't take it too hard if that's what the result ends up being. And with that, Casey, thank you. Thank you for um, giving your insight to our student listeners um, who may be interested in applying for this fellowship and to, uh, give you guys the, where can you find the application? Um, it's uh, www.research.gov. And then you can click toward the bottom right of the screen on the GRFP page. And with that, this has been episode five of Under the Hood, and we'll talk to you next time.